good to see you this morning. Glad that you are here. Happy, uh, happy daylight savings time day. Y'all look rested, and I just want you to know that here at Mountain View Church, we are committed to celebrating daylight savings in the fall. And so we're so committed that every fall, we want to give you an extra hour of sleep in Jesus' name. And so you can, uh, you can thank our church family for collectively deciding to continue to celebrate this extra hour of sleep. In the springtime, that's not on us. That's, that's other churches. They just wanted to do that. But here, we, we value and are committed to your rest. Y'all, I am so excited. I am beyond thrilled with what God's doing here in our church family. Uh, last weekend was incredibly special for us getting to meet so many new people for the very first time coming to check out Mountain View Church. Uh, part of our, uh, our, our event last week with Trunk or Treat and Chili, we just saw God bring and draw so many new families here. Uh, got to meet families who've been part of our Mountain View family for a while, but haven't been here for a minute. And so they've now decided they're, they're ready to come back and, uh, and establish and plant roots and make Mountain View Church their church home. Y'all, God is at work and God is on the move. God has, yeah, that's, it's clap worthy. I'm just telling you, God is at work and God has placed this church family in South Orange County for such a time as this. And we are gonna be committed to being that place where people can gather wherever they're at and wherever they've been to this safe place to find a place to belong wherever they're at in their faith journey. We're committed to being this place that we grow together. Not just growing in knowledge, not just trying to, to amass some Jesus Jeopardy trivia or anything like that, but that we are committed fiercely to growing to be more and more like Jesus. We're committed to taking the story and the hope of the gospel, that Jesus changes lives. We're committed to taking the hope of the gospel to our community, to our city, across this state, and around the world. And I'm telling you, God is at work here in our community. God is at work today in our lives, just like he's been at work in the lives of the people in scripture. Oftentimes we think that, that God only worked then or only worked through these super spiritual, heroic people in biblical times, but y'all, I'm here to tell you that God is still working in and through us today just like he was then. It, it wasn't because Abraham just had exponential amounts of faith. It wasn't because Moses was, it was some incredible, like, earth-shattering kind of leader. It wasn't because Joseph was like the brother of all brothers and defined what brotherhood looked like for the rest of us. When you, when you look at Scripture, we can't separate ourselves from the work of God and just think that the work of God happens then. It wasn't because Hannah was just some prayer warrior with some magical direct connection to, to God. It wasn't because Ezekiel was just this incredible person and leader. It wasn't because of the bravery of Queen Esther. It wasn't just because King David was a mighty warrior. God was at work in their lives just like he's at work in our lives. And I don't want us to miss it. I don't want us to just become accustomed to it to the point that, that we can't see it or we can't recognize it anymore because I'm telling you this morning, y'all, God is at work just like he was in their day. He's at work and he's on the move in our day. And if we want to see Jesus change lives, if we want to see marriages restored, if we want to experience relationships changed forever, if we want to see Jesus change the lives of children here in our community, not just in this generation, but for generations to come, if we want to see teenagers in our community on fire for Jesus in their schools, on their campuses, then it is going to take all of us being all in for what Jesus is calling us to do. It's gonna take every one of us. And you may be just checking out Mountain View for the first time. 
Uh, You may be kind of checking out this whole idea of Jesus, wondering, is Jesus for me? Does Jesus have anything to say about me? But I'm telling you guys, um, it's going to take all of us being all in for what God is calling us to do if we're gonna see the life change that he's put us here in South Orange County for. We gotta be all in, and, and we've talked about it over the last few weeks that God's call on our life is not a choice to consider. God's call on our life isn't a, a pocket dial like he mistakenly called you in an attempt to call somebody else who had their life together. No, God's call on our life is his command for us to obey. And we are committed at this church, I'm telling you, we're committed to following whatever Jesus is calling us to do. Are you ready for that? Are you in on that? Is it just me? Because I'm excited about what God has for our church family. But we've gotta understand what God is doing and how God is moving involves us in so many different ways. And uh, to lay a a foundation for us this morning, to kind of set a framework, I want us to go uh, to a moment in church history that's uh, really foundational in this church, local church movement uh, in the book of Acts. It's this story that unpacks for us and unfolds for us this narrative that we're still a part of today, a narrative that started so many years ago that launched this movement called the local church. And I want us to take a look at some of the final words of the Apostle Paul to a church and his friends in a city of Ephesus. People in this city and part of this church had become family to Paul. He'd done life with these people. He had experienced the highs and lows. He had celebrated those moments of great joy in life that we've all experienced. He grieved in those moments of great pain in life that we've all experienced. And he'd done this very intimately and had lots of influence with this church and these friends of his in the city of Ephesus. And right before Paul heads back to Jerusalem, the the very epicenter of this local church movement, Paul is going back to the city of Jerusalem, a, a city that he knows he has lots of enemies in. Paul knows that he's probably gonna be thrown in prison. He could possibly lose his life, which, spoiler alert, Paul does end up going to Jerusalem. Paul does end up getting put, uh, getting arrested. He gets put on a ship to Rome where he ultimately gives his life for the sake of Jesus. But Paul's got a last message for this church that he's done life with. And the last message is found in Acts chapter 20, And we're gonna pick up in verse 24 when Paul says this, his final words to this church in Ephesus. He says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's vision for his life. For Paul, life isn't about getting anything for himself. Life for Paul was about giving everything he had for Jesus. This this idea, this philosophy that shaped everything about Paul's life was such that he says, my life isn't even valuable to me. This isn't about me at all. Uh, Paul lays this foundation for this church in Ephesus to say, our lives are, ought to be leveraged for the good of others and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Life for the, for the follower of Jesus is not about what we can get, Paul is saying. It's about what we can give. And for Paul, Jesus was everything in his life. Which meant for Paul, if, if he wakes up on a, on a Monday morning and, and he's going to breakfast with some of his friends, then, th- then waking up on that Monday morning means he gets to share Jesus. Uh, if for some reason he's arrested and he's thrown into jail on a Monday morning, that's fine too, because when he's in jail, he's gonna tell people about Jesus. If for some reason he doesn't get, wake up on a Monday morning, if for some reason that he's, he's experienced great persecution that has led to him being a martyr and being killed for the sake of Christ, that's fine for Paul too. 
Because then he gets Jesus. It doesn't matter what circumstances he's walking through. It doesn't matter what season of life he's in. It doesn't matter what happens right or wrong to Paul. Because for Paul, it's a win no matter what because Jesus has changed everything for his life. He's got this framework, this theology, this understanding of just how deep and just how far reaching the gospel is in his life that he's able to say, it doesn't matter, regardless of what happens, we win because we get Jesus. He goes on in in another letter to another church to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is what he's talking about here. For my, I don't account my life of any value to myself. It's not precious to me, but my life is to be lived. Everything that I do is to be given for the good of others and for the sake of the gospel. And over the course of the next few verses, uh, Paul's gonna unpack what this looks like in his life. Verse 34, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, Paul says, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, Paul in this moment is quoting Jesus, and if you've got a copy of scripture that's a physical copy in your hands, you may even notice that Paul, as, as these words are spoken, uh, this quote is in red letters, because Jesus, Paul says, himself has said that it's better to give than it is to receive. When it comes to generosity, when it comes to giving and living, Jesus has this new kingdom ethic for us that says it's better for you to give than it is to receive. To which some of you are like, I knew it. The church is all about money. Uh, To which some of you uh, could say, well, yeah, at some point I knew the conversation about money would come up. And Paul is just saying, hey, no, 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 I'm just pointing you back to the words of Jesus. Now, if you do your homework, if you do a little bit of digging and try to get a little bit of context around this quote from Jesus, if you're like, well, what was Jesus talking about when he said this? Uh, What you'll find is interesting because what you'll find in the Gospels is nothing, Uh, What you'll see is that if you walk through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will not find one time that Jesus says, quote, it is better to give than it is to receive. Now, this is interesting, right? Because it's in red letters. How is this even possible if Jesus didn't say it? Like, is this the moment that we're all caught and and, and this is all a big fraud because Jesus didn't actually say that? No, 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 not at all. Because, in fact, at the end of the Gospel of John, at the very end, John says that what we know about Jesus, if you were to take all of the words of Jesus, if you were to take all of the stories of Jesus, John says in his Gospel at the very end, you could not capture it in all of the books in the world if you tried to capture everything that Jesus said or did. Which is interesting because that means for us today that there is so much more to the life and the teaching of Jesus. It means for us today that apparently somewhere along the way, Jesus had said this at some point in his life. Uh, He had lived this in such a way. He had said this or taught this in such a way that the followers and the disciples of Jesus would have known that this is an axiom of Jesus' life. Uh, Maybe they had heard Jesus say it in their home as he was teaching. Maybe they heard Jesus say it as he was teaching uh, on a hillside with all kinds of different people listening. Maybe it was just in conversation along the way, but at some point Jesus had said this Uh, as a statement, and the disciples knew this is something we need to remember. But for Jesus, this wasn't just something that he had taught. This was something that Jesus had modeled. This was something that Jesus had demonstrated and showed with his life because he was constantly pouring out his life, giving of himself so that others could live, which is important for us to remember 
that we serve a generous God. Literally, the very character and nature of the God that we know and we call Heavenly Father is, in fact, generous at the core. Think about arguably one of the most famous verses uh, in all of Christianity, in all of Scripture. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he, what? He gave We know and we understand the love of God in our life, in our families, because of his generosity. Nothing stopped the generosity of our heavenly father. Because scripture says that he loved us so much that he gave his son. And that he gave everything in giving his son. Because when Jesus shows up, when God literally sends his son, Jesus shows up on the scene, and what did he do? He gave his life. And so what that tells you and it tells me is that we serve a generous God, uh, which means, and the implication in our life is, we ought to be generous because God is generous. We give and we live generously because we worship a generous God. Late pastor and author Tim Keller says, if we don't have a heart to be generous, then we've never understood the gospel. So why, why do we do this? Why are we generous? Like, why would we give of our finances, give of our time, both of which we need in our life? Why would we give when we need every penny that we make to provide for our families? Doesn't doesn't God have everything that he needs? Uh, God doesn't need anything. And this is where the pushback comes when we talk about generosity. But I want you to hear it straight from me. Maybe you need to write it down. Maybe you need to put it in your Evernote or on your notes. But listen to me loud and clear. I don't want anything from you. I don't want anything from you. But I do want something for you. Because I am convinced. I'm convinced. uh, What I know with great conviction, because I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in our own family. We've experienced it in our own finances. I know with confidence, because I've experienced it firsthand. God can do more with 90% of my finances than I can do with 100% of them. I know that... God is not interested in getting any money from you. He just wants to make sure that your money doesn't get you. God's not looking for your money. God's looking for your heart. And God cares more about what happens in your heart than he cares about what's happening in your bank account. Can I go further? God cares more about your character than he cares about your credit score. Can we go further? God cares so much more for you than he does about your stuff. God cares more for your character. He cares more for your heart, which means that God doesn't want anything for you. He want, he, he, God doesn't want anything from you. He wants something for you. And you and I living generously in our life, with our time, in our finances, reminds us that everything we have, not just our salvation, but everything we have comes from God. That someone, somewhere is providing for us in ways that we could not provide for ourselves, and that someone has a name and his name is Jesus. Sure, you got a degree from whatever university that you went to, but make no mistake, God provided the job that you're in, not your resume. Yes, uh, you, you have a God who is providing for you in ways that, that feed your hungry mouths and, and feed all of those little tiny mouths that uh, are the children who've taken your last name. God provides for you in that. God provides for us in everything that we have. He's provided every single thing, the roof over our head. Uh, The transportation that you used to get here, the the fuel in your tank or the charge on your batteries, God has provided that for you. And that's not over spiritualizing things. It's just reminding us in everything that God has given us everything 
that we have. We sang it just a minute ago, even the breath in our lungs. Has anybody in the room been reminding yourself as I've been speaking? Oh, hey, don't forget to breathe. Oh yeah, do that again. No, God gives us that because God provides everything that we have. But Brandon, why do we have to talk about generosity in church? Why do I have to talk about money in in church? That's a personal thing. Stick with me for 90 seconds. Why is it that only in church it has to be an awkward conversation? Like, did SDG&E call you this week and, and say, hey, sorry to bother you again. I know money's a really personal thing and and we're not trying to get into all of your finances and all, but hey, you've used some water this week. Would, would you mind just sending us a check for that? Like, did any of you get a handwritten personal letter from your mortgage company saying, sorry, we don't mean to meddle in your finances. <laughs> That's personal. But if you wouldn't mind, would you, ju- would you just send us a check for your mortgage this week? No, neither of them did that. Why is it awkward? Because churches have made it awkward. And churches have, at times even, I'll admit, there are churches all across the country who have abused this conversation and abused this stewardship that God has given them. But I'm here to tell you straight from the horse's mouth, I don't care about your money. I care about your heart. In fact, King Solomon in Proverbs chapter four says, that above all else, guard your heart. For from your heart springs the rest of your life. Above everything else, King Solomon says. Uh, Above what your kids achieve and accomplish. Uh, Above uh, whatever you achieve and accomplish in your career. Uh, Above where you live, what you drive, and what you carry. Above all else, guard your heart. Because from your heart springs the rest of everything in your life. Jesus took it a step further. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It shouldn't be awkward for us to have this conversation in churches because it wasn't awkward for Jesus. Do you know that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell combined? Did you know that one out of 10 passages in the gospel deals with money? 16 out of the 38 parables, almost half of the parables that Jesus taught have to deal with money and possession. 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, and more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. Was Jesus fixated on money? No. But he knew we would be. And so, Scripture says that we ought to give 10% of everything that God puts in our hands, our first fruits, back to God. It's this automatic and instant way of showing God that you recognize who he is and how he has provided for us. Well, Brandon, isn't Isn't the tithe like an Old Testament thing? Yeah, you caught me. It is. You know what a New Testament thing is? Everything. Yeah, the the tithe is an Old Testament principle, uh, but Jesus, when he's with the rich young ruler, do you know what he told him? Go and sell everything. Not just some of it, all of it. Early Christians, when, when they were part of a local church, they sold their, all of their properties, all of their possessions, all of their stuff, and brought it all to the local church and said, we've got to be generous like Jesus was generous. Paul encouraged uh, early believers to give radically and sacrificially. So when you look at the New Testament, the standard of giving is so much higher. It goes beyond 10% to radical, sacrificial, life-altering generosity. Y'all, we're the most prosperous culture in history. We have so much more than people in the New Testament. And so for us as affluent people in the, in the 21st century, the question becomes, what does radical generosity look like for us? What does it look like for us? Which is the moment we start to, to lean back and say, hey, you know what, the tithe sounds pretty good. 
Because in the New Testament, people gave everything. And I'm here to remind us this morning, baseline, that all scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, was inspired by God and spoken by God for our good and for our growth. And so for Jesus, he uses an all-in mentality. Luke, as he was capturing the beginnings of the local church, uh, this physician uh, wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote uh, some of Acts, which uh, begins to capture the local church and the story of Jesus. And throughout Acts, Luke highlights this connection between mission and resources. Uh, Somehow Luke had had this eye that uh, there's a thread that says if there's going to be a gospel preached, then somebody financially has to be leaned in. Uh, Just take, for example, the story of Acts chapter 2. Uh, Maybe you know the story of the day of Pentecost, but uh, the apostles of Jesus preached the gospel of Jesus, and instantly on that day, in that moment, 3,000 plus people gave their life to Jesus, and the church began as a movement expanding far beyond what anybody could imagine. And with this growing church came growing needs. And in the beginning of the the local church, in Acts chapter two, right after thousands have given their life to Jesus, this is what happens. And they, the believers, the followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Verse 44, and all who believed were together together and had all things in common. Nothing unites, nothing levels the playing field like the gospel of Jesus. Verse 45, and they were selling their possessions. See, I'm not making this up. They were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Listen, there was no blueprint for this. There was no playbook. There was no YouTube that somebody could watch. Oh my goodness, the church is growing. We don't know what to do. No, they just came together and said, we don't have a budget yet, but we gotta pool all of our resources and make sure that everyone gets taken care of immediately on day one of the local church. The description of the church is that people were generous with what they had. Some of you today may say, well, yeah, Brandon, I just, I don't have a whole lot of money. I don't have a whole lot left over. There's not a lot of margin in our expenses. Can I just remind you that we serve a God who is a multiplier? One raindrop in the desert is not gonna do much. It's no surprise that California's in a drought. We've been in a drought. It's been a hot minute since we've been in a drought. It doesn't look like we're gonna get out of a drought for uh, our lifetime. I, I, I don't know. One raindrop, if it falls in Southern California, is not gonna change much. But hundreds and hundreds of raindrops together making thousands and millions of raindrops can turn a desert into a garden. We serve a God who is a multiplier. And here's what that means for you and for me. God hasn't called all of us and everyone to give in abundance, but he has called everyone to give in faithfulness. You may not be able to do everything, but you can do something. Some of you this morning, you're not in a position to say, you know what, I, 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 I can't be generous. And the reason you can't is because you're strapped with debt. And so you're like, yeah, I'm out. I can't be a part of this. But maybe today's your hard reset. Maybe today you're starting to see and hear God call on your life to to be generous. And it just starts with simply getting out of debt. Can I give you a, a money principle? This one's on the house. This one's free. A very simple money principle. You ready? Write it down. Get ready, put it in your notes. Live and spend less than you make. Let's pray. No, it's it's, it's that simple. Uh, There's a moment that, uh, that you just have to 
grow up and say, you know what, debt's dumb. I can't be generous like God's called me to as long as I'm strapped with debt. And so we gotta get out of this so that we can follow what God has for our life. Some of you this morning though, when you look at your giving, your giving, instead of being a tithe, instead of being generous, looks more like a tip. Yeah, you've got the ability, you've got the margin in your finances, but when you look at the way that you give, It's just giving out of the leftovers. I'll give whatever I have left. And Jesus this morning is inviting you into the above and beyond. And it's not because I want your money. It's not because he needs your money. It's because God wants your heart. I'll never forget uh, the first year of a marriage. Kara and I uh, moved from Virginia Beach to Louisville, Kentucky for, uh, for me to study my master's in theology and uh, we decided and, and, and had prayed. I was in ministry prior to moving to Louisville. And we had prayed and really felt like the Lord was calling us and leading us to, uh, to, to take on a role and a job outside of the local church. I'd been a pastor for several years before then. And so both of us, we, we, wanted, to, we wanted to know what it was like to work outside of ministry. Uh, we wanted to know what it was like to, to, to work in a field with people who didn't know Jesus. And so we both worked retail. I was a manager at a photography studio and Kara worked at Hallmark. And if you work in retail, especially this time of year, God bless you. It's incredibly difficult, uh, unappreciated work. Uh, So we did this for a couple of years and um, we, we just made pennies. But our family was committed. We had a principle that we made a foundation in our life and in our budget that we would give first. Whenever we made money, we would give first. We would save second. And then we would live off the rest. And there were some weeks where we were like writing a check to our church for $30 because we'd made 300 bucks that week. There were other weeks that we were able to give $40 There was one time I'll never forget where we got Christmas overtime pay. We gave $200 to the local church that we were a part of. And we were so excited. We were thrilled to be able to get to give to what God was doing in this local church we were a part of in Louisville. I'll never forget when we received our W-2s that year. Uh, It was the first time that we had paid taxes. I thought, how in the world? will we afford to be able to pay taxes on the income that we've made this year? I thought, my wife, she's not gonna wanna stay with me because she's she's gonna see we can't afford to pay taxes this year. And so we go into a Sears. You guys remember those things? All the craftsmen, we're walking through all of the craftsman tools and then all the treadmills and we get to the back of Sears and they've got an H&R block in the back of Sears. Somebody with me this, this morning? We go and we sit down and we, uh, we uncover all of this financial information and we turn in all of our W-2s and we give all of our information about all of our finances to this lady at H&R Block. And I'll never forget the fear in my mind thinking, I don't know if we can pay our taxes. We're gonna go bankrupt. It's over. Until she finished with our taxes and said, uh, hey, Reed family, this year you're getting a return. You're getting 3000 $800, which was a huge, huge amount of money back. We weren't sure we could pay it, but what we saw was God provides every single need we have. I'm not just making up this story to tell you that God provides just for, for illustration purposes. I'm telling you we've experienced it in our own life. When we trust God, God provides every single time. You know why we're generous? It's not because we've got to check a box. It's not because we should or we ought to. It's not because Jesus requires this so that we can somehow get our lives over the threshold into eternity with him. No, why are we generous? We're generous because we get to be generous. We get in our life, 
here on earth to be more like Jesus in every aspect of our life. And when we're generous, we get to see God do what only he can do. You heard Marty say it just a minute ago, uh, how because of your generosity, there are hundreds of families who are fed right here in our community because of your faithful generosity. Uh, Did you know because of your generosity on Thursday night, every Thursday night, right here where you're sitting, this place becomes so loud with the praises of my friends in the Summit Ministry. Did you know that because of your generosity, children's lives for generations to come Did you know that children are bringing their parents to church with them because there's a dynamic children's ministry right here in our church? So we have a choice today. It's a choice to trust the Lord in every area of our life. A choice to become more like Jesus in every area of our life. A choice to take God at his word. A choice to say, hey, I'm all in. Not just halfway, not part way. I don't have a toe dipped into the water. No, this is a moment for us to say with our time, our treasures, and our talents, we are all in for what Jesus is doing. God's at work. And he's inviting you to be a part of it. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful for your generosity. We're grateful that you didn't just teach us. You didn't just talk to us about what generosity looks like you showed us. And as you showed us, you modeled sacrifice for us. And so today, God, may we, may we begin to take a simple step. May we start somewhere with something, trusting you in everything. God, may today be a moment where we experience your generosity so much that it changes the trajectory of our relationships, of our budgeting, of how we serve and volunteer. God, change everything about us so that we look more and more like Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.